You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Peter Nealon. At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show, and we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it, and uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. It doesn't cost you a single penny. audibletrial.com slash Hank. And uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories, Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today, visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Who wants to love a billionaire? Billionaires in New York, book one by Laura Burton. Do you have a favorite writer whose books are auto buys for you? Wouldn't you love for readers to have you on their auto buy list, then recommend your books to their friends and on social media? The good news is there are subtle things you can do, things that are nearly invisible to the reader, that will make your stories unputdownable. The Beyond 10 Days course from Victory Editing can help you get the most from your stories and help you build that relationship with readers through your writing. This course is full of awesome, and best of all, you don't have to fly across the country or put on pants. In this course, we'll focus on avoiding info dumps, dialogue mechanics, show versus tell in dialogue, carrying show versus tell forward to your narrative, deepening your point of view and strengthening your protagonist's voice, overriding and how to avoid it. 10 hours of video content with text and audio downloads. Shine that diamond. Join me at the Beyond 10 Days course. Go to hankgarner.com and click the banner to sign up today. The Forsaken Mercenary series by Jonathan Yanez. A near future thriller series is now available on audible.com the series that readers have loved is now available in your favorite format audiobook format the first book is called drop ship in the forsaken mercenary series if they can't control him they'll try and kill him daniel hunt is the deadliest mercenary in the galaxy if he can just remember five years before he woke up with nothing more than his name now his present is on a violent collision with his past and the future of the galaxy. The Earth is dead. Humanity is taken to the Moon and Mars to have a chance. On what's left of Earth, primal gangs war for dominance. A rebel force will discover a weapon of unimaginable strength the wealthy in the galaxy will do anything to possess. As Daniel unravels the origin of his past, he'll realize he's not the same weapon he once was. But does redemption exist for someone like him? For fans of Jason Bourne and the Weapon X program, this one's for you. Grab your hand cannon and start listening now. The Forsaken Mercenary series, book one drop ship, available on audible.com now from Jonathan Yanez. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have one of my favorite crime writers on the show today. Sophie Hanna has an amazing new book. It's called Perfect Little Children. And I'm going to tell you, Sophie, this uh, 
uh, this book had my my brain twisted in knots for you know a couple of days. So it's uh, <laughs> uh, I absolutely Excellent. enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so welcome that's to the show. That's definitely what I like to hear. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got so much to talk about, but before we do, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Interesting. Well, my first memory was reading Enid Blyton's books as a child. I don't know whether you know about Enid Blyton. She's much more famous in England than she is in America. But she wrote loads and loads of mystery stories in which gangs of children solved crimes. They they sort of got together and formed like detective societies and then solved mysteries. And I can remember at about the age of six or seven reading, reading an Enid Blyton mystery and thinking, I just love these mystery stories and I just want to read all of them and I want to write them. Uh, and becoming a mystery fan, really, at the age of six or seven. So to you, uh, the genre of mystery is, is kind of wrapped up in your desire uh, to tell stories. It, it's all it's all rolled up into one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think mysteries, obviously, I would say this, I'm biased, but for <laughs> me, mysteries are the best kinds of stories by far. I agree with you. There's something about having a puzzle set before you and, you know, getting, getting involved with characters and, and seeing how they navigate through the world and then rooting for them and, and wanting to get in there and help them. There's, there's the mysteries do that like no other genre. Yeah. And they've got a really good, you know, they've got suspense and they've got a really solid plot structure. And I think that, you know, the mystery genre is the only genre that acknowledges that one of the main motivations we have in real life that gets us through the day is the desire to know things that we don't yet know. You know, we're always puzzling over things in our everyday life and trying to work out what does this person mean when they're saying this thing and do they really like us and can we trust them? And, you know, we have that sort of puzzled and unable to know thing challenging us all the way through life every day. And mystery fiction is the only genre that acknowledges that and says, you know what, we know how much you want to know that you can never know. And so we're going to give you a story where you get that frustration of not knowing, but there's a guarantee that you will find out, that you will get the answer, which obviously real life doesn't offer that that deal at all. So I just think it's for that reason, I think it's an incredibly satisfying genre. Well, it, it's very powerful, both from a reader standpoint and uh, the writer standpoint. You know, the, the reader, like you said, w we know that there will be resolution and we know that we can uh, – there's something we can hang our hat on. We may not like the resolution, but we know that, that we will have a firm answer. And yeah. as a writer, it's it's almost like you know being the god of a world. You, you have all of the control. You control all of the reader's emotions. And, you know, we get to take them on a trip like no one else can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, at what point did you start writing your own mystery stories? Oh, I was writing mystery stories from probably about the age of about seven or eight. Uh, but they weren't very good. <laughs> they were quite immature. And I carried on writing, you know, all through my teenage years, I was writing mystery stories. And then when I was about 17 or 18, I started writing longer mystery stories which in terms of their length really had to qualify as as novels and I sent them off to publishers I had no idea how immature and amateurish they were but I did send them out to lots of publishers so I was obviously thinking of being a published crime writer even then uh, and obviously they got rejected which I'm now very grateful for because they really weren't up to scratch um, but yeah I was I was doing it from childhood that's fantastic um, were there any other people in your life, maybe uh, a teacher at school or a, a parent, someone of influence that recognized uh, this desire and gift that you had? Yeah, I mean, my parents were always very encouraging of my uh, my mystery writing impulses. Definitely. Did uh, at what point um, did you start thinking that this was well, obviously very young because you were sending off. Uh, stories to publishers, but um, uh, when do you feel like you sort of came into your own and you had gotten your, uh, you know, your your head around 
what makes a mystery and, and felt like that, uh, you know, that, that this was something you could have success with? Well, only really many years later. So after I had three mystery novels rejected when I was in my late teens, I then decided to have a break from mystery writing. And I must admit, at that point, I thought, maybe I'm just not very good at it. Maybe this is not what I'm cut out to do. Um, so I, I had a break and I wrote lots of other things. And then it was only when I was 31 and I'd had my first baby and I had an idea which just seemed to me the perfect idea for a psychological thriller. So I thought, I'll just have one more go at writing crime fiction. <laughs> and that became my first published crime novel, Little Face. Oh, if uh, if I had a penny for every uh, every author who has, you know, had that same experience, I'll, I'll just try one more time. There's, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, can't, yeah. I can't quite let it go. Just one more time. Uh, yeah, and I'm so glad I was persistent. I know, I know, and there's, you know, that persistence is uh, is unique to writers. Uh, a lot of times, there there are lots of other pursuits that you just kind of decide. Well, I'm just I'm just not going to be any good at it. Um, but I, I remember talking with Brandon Sanderson uh, a while back, the the fantasy writer, and and he said I was going to write books because I love to write books, and if I never would have been published, then my children would have inherited a house that had manuscripts just stuffed into every closet. And, you know, it was just, I, I had to do this thing, whether anyone read them or not. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. So, so what was that first book that you had published? Uh, it's called Little Face. And it starts with a woman who has just had a baby two weeks earlier and she's back at home with the baby and her husband. And she goes out for the first time since the birth and she nip, just nips out for a couple of hours, leaving the baby at home with her husband. And when she gets back to the house, there is a baby in the house and it's asleep in her baby's crib and it's wearing her baby's clothes. But she starts screaming and swears blind that the baby in the house is not her daughter mm. and that while she was out, somebody must have come in and swapped her baby for another baby. And meanwhile, her husband is completely adamant that no such thing has happened. And he says she's gone mad. How can she not see that it's obviously their baby? Uh, so he is uh, very much disagreeing with uh, <laughs> with her on this issue. Those um, those topics uh, seem to pop up a lot in your writing. The the idea of the things that are closest to us and most precious um, that a, that a great mystery could be uh, derived from the common everyday uh, and, and it kind of speaks to, um, you know, our fears of these things that we hold so closely uh, and, and what would happen if something happened to one of our, our babies or, you know, some, a friend close to us. Um, what do you think it is about those types of topics and subjects that, uh, that hit so close to home uh, in, in mysteries? Um, well, I think it's just the, the sort of the combination of the everyday and the part that we can identify with really easily, and then the the sort of very extraordinary. So it's like everyone can identify with feeling a bit overwhelmed, bringing a new baby back from the hospital, how you know precious that baby is and how desperate you are to keep them safe, but also you have to occasionally go out and leave them with someone else. And then, you know, we've all, anyone who's had kids has experienced that. And then to take that ordinary really relatable beginning and then have the plot turn into something completely extraordinary. That's, I mean, the shout line, the, the book's shout line when it was first published in England was it's every mother's nightmare. Uh, and it became a word of mouth bestseller. And I think the reason it did is because so many people could relate to so much of it. And then they thought, and that would be my worst nightmare if I came back and there was a different baby there and I was convinced it was a different baby, but no one believed me. I mean, that is every mother's worst nightmare. So sure, uh, sure. I think I think it helps in terms of, you know, for a book to catch on. I think it helps if there's something archetypal about it. I've often pondered, uh, you know, why um, I in particular love these kinds of books and why I want to be scared like that. Um, but th there's something about facing your worst fears from the comfort of your reading chair and and getting to look that in the face while 
also having your family close to you and, and everyone be safe and sound. Um, what, what do you think it is? Why do we love these kinds of books? I think it's almost sort of like we like to scare ourselves and almost have the adrenaline rush and the fear and also the opportunity to sort of build our resilience, but in an unreal setting. We don't actually want that disaster and that adrenaline and that fear in real life, but by sort of experiencing it while also knowing that you're safe, it's kind of a way to begin to cope with the idea that there are genuinely scary things in the world. Sure. When did you become a fan of Agatha Christie? Age 12. So my dad used to go to a lot of uh, secondhand book fairs. He loved collecting secondhand books. And he came back from a book fair with a copy of The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie because he knew that I'd enjoyed the Secret Seven mysteries and all the mysteries I read as a child. Uh, and he thought, right, Agatha Christie's a, a sort of grown-up mystery writer. And he thought he'd just try me with one of her books. And I absolutely loved it and became completely addicted and read all of her books over the next two years. Fantastic. I, I picked up a copy of The Mystery of the of Three Quarters last year and just loved what you did uh, with her characters. And you just really nailed that Agatha Christie voice and then realized that you had written a couple more before that and, and, and grabbed those as well. Um, what was that experience like getting to step into, uh, you know, Miss Christie's shoes? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, I mean, obviously it was slightly daunting to be asked to do it, but it was also the most exciting creative challenge that I could possibly imagine. Um, and I loved it, loved every minute of it. How, how did you get tapped to, to do those? Well, my agent was at a meeting at Harper Collins. Harper Collins are, Agatha Christie's publishers and my agent was at a meeting in their office and he happened to be sitting next to a shelf full of Agatha Christie novels um, and he remembered he saw these novels in the shelf and he remembered that I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan and he just said to this HarperCollins editor I've got this author Sophie Hannah she's a huge Christie fan why don't you get her to write a new Poirot or Miss Marple novel? And Harper Collins said, there's no way the Christie family would ever allow it. And then the very next day, Harper Collins and the Christie family had, you know, their regular meeting to discuss the backlist and Agatha publishing. And at that meeting, Agatha Christie's grandson, Matthew Pritchard, who at the time was chairman of Agatha Christie Limited, he said to the Harper Collins team, this is really going to surprise you after everything we've said all these years. But we, the family, are starting to think that now might be the time to think about a new novel of some kind, an, an Agatha Christie brand novel. Uh, at which point the editor said, well, this is very strange because... Um, <laughs> How fortuitous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we've, we've had this agent who reckons he's got the perfect author. How How bizarre. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. What, yeah. what, what do you do to prepare yourself to uh, to take on that role? Uh, well, what I did, I actually, I do it for all my prior novels. I, um, I just reread some or all of Agatha's prior novels. And that gets me into the tone and the mood. Uh, and so that, that tends to be what I do. And that tends to be all I do in terms of preparation, but it's enough because it immerses me in the world of Agatha Christie and her, her work. You know, with the 100th anniversary of uh, murder on the Orient express, uh, was it last year or the year before? Um, I forget, but it, it was recently. Uh, and they, they made the new movie uh, based on it. And uh, I took my whole family. We, we went to see it and I was just reminded how amazing those stories are, even though I had read that book, you know, a dozen times and knew every twist and turn, knew the resolution. I was still just had this joy uh, watching mm -hmm. it and then, you know, found myself going back and, and rereading a bunch of the books. Just, you know, after a hundred years, they still hold up and they're just great, great mysteries. Um, yeah. That yeah. Oh, no, they absolutely are. They're amazing. Yeah. Man, what what a uh, I, I know that's something that you're extremely proud of in, in your career to to 
be able to step in and do that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's been a it's been a fantastic experience. Are there any more of those uh, slated for the future? Uh, yes. So I've just finished one, and that's coming out in August. That's oh, nice. my fourth prior novel, and it's called The Killings at Kingfisher Hill. Mm, I can't wait. That's going to be amazing. <laughs> so so after the first book, Little Face, um, that you released, um, how did you how did you follow up that book? Uh, and you, you said that it became a, you know, a word of mouth kind of phenomenon and people were loving the book and, and it kept coming out, uh, or, you know, it kept getting more and more readers and more. Um, you know, fanfare, but after having a successful first novel like that, um, you know, and we, we talk a lot about the anonymity, uh, the gift of anonymity with that first book. No one knows that you're doing it. No one's expecting anything from you. But yeah. then when you have a debut novel and, you know, it does something and people like it and they like you and your voice, uh, is there pressure to follow that up from then on? Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, you've heard the expression second novel syndrome. Um, where, you know, people talk about difficult second novel syndrome right. or difficult, difficult second album syndrome, where you've had one success and it kind of paralyzes you. you. You become scared because you think, can I repeat that? And I know that's a real thing because so many um, writers seem to suffer from it. But I've always suffered from the opposite or rather not not suffered. <laughs> I've, I've always had the opposite. The first book I write after I know that a book has worked really well, I'm always happy and confident and I write a better book than I otherwise would. So my second crime novel after Little Face, that was in America, it was called The Truth Teller's Lie. And when I wrote that book, I was happier and more confident than ever before because I'd just written a book that had done amazingly well. So I was like, great, now you know, this is the first book I'm writing, knowing that people actually want this product that I'm producing. And I had the same experience with my um, second Poirot novel, you know, knowing that I'd been asked to write a second one because the first one had done amazingly well. That just gave me more enthusiasm and more confidence. Well, And you had been preparing yourself for years for this. This was this was the the hope and dream. And you you had the opportunity to uh, to live your your hope and dream that's uh, uh it, it helps to go in prepared doesn't it <laughs> yeah although i have to say i i never hoped or dreamed to write christy brand novels because i just it's not well, that sure. i didn't, it's not that i didn't want to do it i just never thought it was any sort of realistic possibility so it just didn't occur to me in any way that well, it was, and- <laughs> and if you, if you start saying that I'm going to take up, you know, the, the uh, Puro uh, line, people will think you're mad. You know, that's not something that you get to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, by my count, you you've written uh, and published uh, probably more than 20 books at this point. Is that right? Oh, yeah, a lot more. I mean, I, I don't actually know how many I have. I must add it up at some point. But my publicist reckons it's about 31 books, wow. including – uh, self-help books, novels, poetry, children's books, because I've written in various different genres. But but you always come back to mystery and thriller, don't you? Yes, I do. So far, I always have. Yeah. And your your newest uh, book is called Perfect Little Children. We we mentioned it earlier. I believe in the UK that book is called Haven't They Grown? Is that right? Yes, it is. It's called Haven't They Grown, but my American publisher's thought that that title wouldn't work well in America. And so they suggested calling it Perfect Little Children. And um, I just thought if they are sure that that would work better in their market, then I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to try and make out that I know better than them because they're the experts in their market. Well, Perfect Little Children kind of buries the lead a little bit. Um, It's uh, I, I didn't know what to expect from this book and from you know, by the time I hit chapter two, I was all in. I was, I had <laughs> to know where you were taking me. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, the idea for this book, if you will. Um, and, and when, when you're starting a new book, what usually comes to you first? Is it, is it a character? Is it, uh, some plot point or device that you've been mulling over? Is it a, a headline in a newspaper? What's the thing that causes the spark for you? 
what usually comes first is one of two things. Either I will have an idea for what I think is a brilliant beginning of a book, or I will have an idea for what I think is a brilliant ending. And it always starts with one or the other. So I either get the opening hook in the case of Perfect Little Children, that is the heroine Beth is taking her son to a soccer match that's near the new house of a friend she hasn't seen for 12 years. She and this friend had some kind of falling out and they've not been in touch for 12 years. But she knows that this friend's new mansion, uh, her friend came into a lot of money and bought a mansion and Beth, the heroine, knows that this mansion is just near the football ground, the soccer ground where her son is playing. So she thinks while he's playing, she's going to go and have a nosy at the house. And while she's there spying on the house from the safety of her car, her friend, Flora, drives back up to the house and she sees her going in through the gates and getting out of her car. And then Flora opens the back door of the car and says, come on, Thomas, come on, Emily, out you get. And Beth thinks to herself, why is she talking to her children, Thomas and Emily, as if they're still tiny toddlers? You know, they must they must be great big teenagers by now, because when Beth last saw Thomas and Emily, they were five and three years old. And then as she watches from her car, five year old Thomas and three year old Emily climb out of the car and they they look exactly the same as they did 12 years ago. They haven't got any older they're no taller. And she's heard Flora call them by their names. And so she thinks, what on earth am I seeing here? Why haven't these children grown? <laughs> Hence the English title, Haven't They Grown? <laughs> right. And, and Flora looks as you would expect her to, um, the same, but, you know, with 12 years of age, as she should be. Yeah, the same, but older. Yeah. Right, right. That, uh, you know, what, what a fantastic setup. Uh, so when you get an idea like that and, and you've got, oh, this is, this is going to be an, an amazing hook, um, because your books are so well plotted and so twisty and, um, it, you know, you take us on an adventure, um, on purpose, it feels like, um, do, are you a, a big planner from the beginning? Do you, do you plot out the novel ahead of time? Absolutely. Yes. I am a, a, a devotee of planning. And I know lots of writers don't plan, but I, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I plan everything in great detail so that by the time I start writing the novel, I've got a chapter by chapter, scene by scene plan of every single thing that needs to happen in the book, in what order. And that just means that I get all the sort of story construction out of the way before I have to worry about actually writing it well and bringing it all to life. And I just find that, for me, dividing up the work into story construction and actually writing it as well as I can, that makes the whole process much easier and less stressful for me. When you start, uh, when, you, when you begin with a great hook like that, and, and you know, you've, you've got this inherent mystery there that needs to be unraveled, do you start thinking about the end and how you're going to resolve this? Or do you start just going step by step through the, the process until uh, you, you get to the end of the plotting? And it's a it's, you know, as much a mystery to you as it is the reader. No. So if if my first idea is for the, the beginning, so in other words, the opening mystery, I don't even start to do the plan until I know that I've got an ending that works well with that beginning. And the reason I the reason I don't take that risk is because I like to start with these really difficult, outlandish, almost impossible scenarios like Beth seeing these two children who haven't grown in twelve years. Now that's such a an unusual premise, I can't take for granted that if I just start writing that I will arrive at an ending that works. So I have to be sure I've got that ending that works before I put in serious time to writing the book. Right. One thing that you are masterful at is the, the art of misdirection. Um, as soon as you'll, you'll lay out clues and I'll think I'll know exactly where you're going. And then you pull the rug right out from under me and you're like, Nope, you took the wrong turn and it's been over here all along. Uh, do you take great joy in doing that to us? 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I must admit, I love it when, you know, if you're, if you're a real crime fiction fan like I am, all that thing of, you know, planting clues so that they're very visible, but knowing that because of some kind of misdirection, the reader will not either notice them or they will notice them, but they will misinterpret them. I love all of that. And it's because that's what I love as a reader. You know, as a reader, there's nothing I love more than getting to the end of a book and, and thinking, wow, I was really fooled. That writer was much cleverer than me. Because uh, that's what you want. You don't want to read a book where you know what's going on. You want to read a book where you're going to be totally surprised and impressed by the ingenuity. That's what I love about Agatha Christie. You know, her books are really ingenious. Right. right. Well, after writing, you know, 30 some odd books, as you said earlier, um, has your writing process changed over the years? Um. Only in the sense that I I now do these very thorough plans. I've always been a bit of a planner, but I've never been quite so much of a planner as I became when I actually it was when I started um, when I started writing the Pyro novels. That was when I first became a proper planner. Um, so yeah, so I think that's um, that's a, a change that has enabled me to write much more efficiently and with less stress. Uh, and I think my own sort of inner editorial sense has become much stronger. You know, I, I used to write things and have no idea whatsoever whether they were any good or not. Uh, and now I can um, I can make sure that by the time they go to my editor, they're good enough. She she always um, actually I've got several editors because I have a different one for my Poirot from my other novels, but. I now work with editors who who will always come up with suggestions for how to improve the book, uh, but I I can now at least make sure that there's a basic, decent standard. Whereas before, when I first started, I would just write books and send them in, sort of hoping for the best, with no clue whether they were good or terrible. Have you discovered any any tools uh, or any uh, a piece of software, anything like that, that has made the planning process easier or, uh, you know, um, easier for you to navigate? No. I mean, I've heard a lot about this software called Scrivener. Right. Many writers say it's amazing. I don't like the idea of relying on any software to make my writing process more efficient. I feel that if I'm organized about it, I should be able to develop a system uh, that makes my writing as easy as possible. And that that's what I do. I develop my own systems. And, and my very thorough plan is a system that works brilliantly for me. So I don't feel I need anything else um, to help me to sort of make the writing easier. Yeah. The Perfect Little Children is out everywhere now. I know you've got the, the new uh, Poirot novel coming out this summer. Um, or have you begun working... Uh, on one of your standalone thrillers uh, for next year? Um, I've begun thinking about it. So I've only just finished the fourth Poirot novel, and I'm still waiting to know what edits I need to do to it from the from my various editors. So um, I'll probably not start writing the next thriller for a couple of months because when I get the edits back for Poirot 4, then I will have to work on those. And I, I generally find that I need a break between books. There are writers that I know who um, who go from one book to another. They write, they type the end on one book, and the very next day they start their next book. <laughs> and for me, that would just be my worst nightmare. <laughs> I would not like to do that at all. I need some head clearing space. Those uh, those devious plots don't just pop up on their own. They they need some space, don't they? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they certainly do. Yeah. Uh, Sophie, it's been so much fun chatting. Perfect Little Children is available everywhere when you're hearing this in hardcover and Kindle edition and audiobook. I absolutely love your audiobooks. Uh, I'm a big audiobook fan, and I've I've listened to several on audio, and they're just fantastic. Uh, oh, thank um, you. Yeah. If, if people are just learning about you, uh, is there a place where they can connect with you online and uh, dig into your back catalog and you know read about news coming up and all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is sophiehanna.com and I'm also on Twitter 
at Sophie Hanna CB1. Those are the two most obvious places to find me. And the website has uh, information about, you know, all my books. I also write self-help. I've written a self-help book called How to Hold a Grudge, in which I argue that (laughs) holding grudges is actually good for us for a whole range of reasons. And that book has a podcast that goes with it. So if anyone wants to hear me talking about why holding grudges is good for you, contrary to what we've all been taught, my How to Hold a Grudge podcast is available on all the usual podcast platforms. That's fantastic. I'll put links to all of that good stuff in the show notes of this episode, uh, as well as the new book. Uh, Sophie, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The Near Future Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, The probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, The probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. 
Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> How? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk, decayed wood, used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? he asked. 
He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty 